God, we thank you for this day. We're thankful for the uh, opportunity and the ability that we have to worship you. We are come to you now asking you to be with us. Help us to express our love for you and our worship today. Help us to, to worship you with our, all of our hearts, all of our being, all of our mind. Help our focus be on Christ and you, Father, and help us to express that love that we have for you. Father, we ask you to be with this church. We ask you to be with our, our elders and our deacons and decisions that they're made. Father, we ask you to be with our, um, our ministry staff. I ask you to be with David and Shelly and, and their kids and, and Brian and Amanda and their kids and with Wesley and, and help them in the jobs and the roles that they do and they perform. Father, we ask a special blessing on our youth who started back to school the last week and who go this week again, and our college students who are gonna be leaving this week and next week. Father, we ask that you be with them, help their lights to shine for all the world, for all their campuses, for wherever they are. Help them to show the world that they belong to you and you alone. Father, right now, again, I just thank you for this opportunity that you offer us to be able to pray to you. And we are thankful that Jesus came and that he is our savior and that he was risen on the third day. And it's in his name that we pray. Amen. As we start this morning, I want to read from Psalm chapter 105. Psalm chapter 105 as we start. Oh, give thanks to the Lord. Call upon his name. Make known the deeds of the peoples. Sing to him. Sing praises to him. Tell of his wondrous works. Glory in his holy name. Let the hearts of those who seek the Lord rejoice. Seek the Lord and his strength. Seek his presence content continually. Remember the wondrous works that he has done, his miracles and the judgments he uttered. I will enter his gates with thanksgiving in my heart. reading this morning comes from Ephesians 4 verses 1 through 6. I therefore, a prisoner for the Lord, urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called with all humility and gentleness with patience, bearing with one another in love, eager to maintain the unity of the spirit and the bond of peace. There is one body and one spirit, just as you were called to the one hope that belongs to your call, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all.
yesterday was uh, my wife and my anniversary. Uh, thank you. And uh, it <clears throat> made me think of the passage from Ephesians chapter 5, uh, probably a passage that we think of most often when we're talking about uh, the husband-wife relationship. Uh, perhaps you've heard this passage uh, mentioned at, at weddings. Um, <clears throat> but I'd like to read, starting in verse 22. It says, Wives, be subject to your own husbands as to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, as Christ also is the head of the church, he himself being the Savior of the body. But as the church is subject to Christ, so also the wives ought to be to their husbands in everything. Husbands, love your wives, just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself up for her, so that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word, that he might present in himself, or to himself, the church in all her glory, having no spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that she would be holy and blameless, so husbands ought also to love their own wives as their own bodies. He who loves his own wife loves himself. For no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it, just as Christ also does the church. Because we are members of his body, for this reason a man shall leave his father and mother and shall be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. This mystery is great, but I am speaking with reference to Christ and the church. Nevertheless, each individual among you also is to love his own wife, even as himself. The wife must see to it that she respects her husband. And we hear that again at, at weddings. But <clears throat> Paul here mentions that this mystery is great, verse 32, but I'm speaking with reference to Christ and the church. You know, there, perhaps there is no person in this world that we would, as husbands, be willing to sacrifice more for than our spouse. I think all of us could say that, you know, we would be willing to die for our spouse. You know, there may be, you know, maybe aside from my kids, there may be no one else in this room, as much as I love you all, that I would be willing to put myself in front of a bullet to stop. But we think about the love that Christ had for each of us Romans chapter 5 tells us that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Christ stepped in front of that sentence of death and prevented us from having to endure the wrath of God. He ultimately was a sacrifice that kept us from the punishment that we deserved. And he showed us that great love through that sacrifice. And in a sense, that, that love that he showed to us is the, the love that we have for our spouse. <clears throat> Would you please bow with me as we pray for the, the love? Our Father in heaven, we are so thankful for the blessings uh, that we have uh, on this earth. We're thankful for, uh, for our families. We're thankful for our spouses, we're thankful uh, that we can look to that relationship and see how uh, it represents your relationship with the church. We're thankful for the church that, that you uh, created through being willing to endure the cross, to take on the punishment that we were deserving of. We're thankful that we are able to be members of that church, of that body. We pray, Heavenly Father, that you would be with us as we partake of this emblem, this loaf which represents Christ's body. We're thankful for uh, the, the amount of love that was displayed through that uh, selflessness, through that, through that sacrifice. Pray that you would please be with us as we partake of this emblem at this time. We ask it through your Son. Amen.
pray for the fruit of the vine. Our Father in heaven, again we come before you thankful for the sacrifice of Jesus. We're thankful for uh, his willingness to, to suffer and die uh, on our behalf. We're thankful for uh, his shed blood which uh, enables us to no longer have to uh, sacrifice year by year imperfect animals and uh, animals with, with blemish. We're thankful that we have uh, a perfect sacrifice that we're able to look to, uh, that we're able to uh, come into contact with through uh, immersion in water. We're thankful for Jesus and the love that he showed to us by going to the cross and enduring what he did. I pray now that you would please be with us as we partake of this emblem. We're thankful for it and thankful for our ability to reflect on this each week. We ask it through your son. Amen. think about the, the blessings that we have uh, in the country that we live in, the freedoms that we enjoy, uh, the abundance, knowing that we, we drove here in a car, knowing that much of the world isn't able to enjoy that luxury. Uh, let's go to our Father in prayer. Our Father in heaven, uh, we recognize the uh, abundance that you have blessed each of us with. We're thankful for those blessings. We pray that you would help us to never take those things for granted and that we remember uh, that you have given us so much. We're thankful for uh, the jobs that we have that help us to provide for our families. We're thankful for uh, this congregation and for the ability that uh, it has to spread your gospel throughout the world. We pray that you would be with uh, this collection. We pray that it would be used in such a way that many souls are reached. Pray that you would be with the hearts of those in the world, that they would be receptive to the message as they encounter it. We just pray uh, that you would be with us as we contribute to this work. And we ask it through your Son. Amen. Find us today. Uh, we serve a great God, and I'm, I'm glad that uh, you all see that um, uh, fit to be here. Um, we have a great youth program here. We have a really great youth program here. Um, our kids, they love God. And they're really good kids. Our parents are here, and, and they always lend a helping hand whenever they can. Uh, they're great chaperones. Um, the members here, you guys help so much 
with everything that we do. And I, I am blessed by all of you. Um, and today, uh, we're talking a little bit about what we did in our summer in the youth. Um, we, uh, we went to camp, right? We always go to camp. It was really uplifting. The, the theme was hope um, or holy. It was, it was really good. Um, after that, we went to Gina, Louisiana. We did a mission trip there. Uh, we, helped, uh, we helped people with their lawns. We gave cards. We did a great VBS there. Uh, right after that, we went to Horizons at Freed Hardeman University, and it was awesome. Uh, we, we did VBS here, and we had some of our kids helping in that. Uh, after that, we took our juniors and seniors, seniors that are going to college, juniors that are going to be seniors. And we had one last trip with those guys. And for our juniors that are going to be seniors, uh, we talked to them about leadership and how important it is for the youth. And we had, a, we had a really great summer. It was awesome to be a part of. And one thing that we do every single summer is to go along with all the fun that we have and all the trips that we take. Uh, we have a summer theme. And we'll go over that on Sunday nights, um, or Sunday mornings, rather, and, uh, and Wednesday nights. Um, and this year's was unity. We talked about the importance of unity. Uh, within our group, within our church, uh, within people, um, within people around us, the churches that are scattered all throughout, um, and it was it was an awesome thing. And what I what I get to do, and it's probably one of the coolest things about my job, is that whenever I set a theme, right, I get to learn the most about that theme <laughs> um, because I want to be uh, ready to teach, right. And so as I was going through and I was thinking about all this and how are we going to do unity, I started to see unity is spread all throughout your Bible. Unity is all throughout your Bible. You look in the story of, of the first chapter of Acts, um, you think of how Luke was writing, and he says that Jesus is ascending, right? And all the disciples are there, all the followers of Jesus, and they're looking up, and they see Jesus leave, and he's, he's not there anymore. And these two uh, these two men in white robes, right, they say, why, why are you looking up? And what happens is, from that moment, the followers of Jesus, they go back to Jerusalem, and they go into the room, and you see in Acts chapter 1, verse 14, this is the first thing that they do right after Jesus ascends. It says, all of these were continually devoting themselves with one mind to prayer, along with the woman and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and with his brothers. And can I tell you the really cool thing, this, this unity that they had in prayer in this room after Jesus has ascended, what happens is you see in Acts 2 the fulfillment of that. You see what happens in Acts 2. The Spirit comes into the room, and they start speaking in, in tongues and all these different languages, and people are understanding them, thousands. And Peter stands up, and he says, you crucified the Christ. And in Acts chapter 2, verses 30, or 37 and 38, this is what the people said in response to Peter's message. They said, Now when they heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, Brothers, what shall we do? And Peter said to them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Unity that day led to thousands being saved. Unity that day in Acts 1 led to thousands being saved. And a church that started from it. Not only that, but there's, there's some more. If you look in Acts 7 and you read the story of Stephen and how he's murdered, what happens right after that is Saul, otherwise known as Paul, starts ravaging the church, right? And everybody scatters. And so Acts 11, when you start reading some more into Acts, you're going to see the outcome of what that was. There's churches all scattered all throughout the region, and this person comes down in Acts 11, starting around verse 27 and 28, and he says there's going to be a great famine. And what happens in Acts chapter 11, verses 29 through 30, they say this. It says the disciples determined that everyone according to his ability to send relief for the brothers living in Judea. And it says they did so, and they sent it to the elders by the hand of Barnabas and Saul. Not only unity within the church that you're at, but unity on a wide spectrum where when people are in need, you help, whether they be hundreds or thousands of miles away. And the really cool thing is that our youth did that. We did that. We got to go to Gina, Louisiana, and we got to make an impact 
of people that we don't see for 51 weeks out of the year, but we made an impact for that week. And kids that otherwise wouldn't be in church, they got to go to church. And people that really needed help with their lawns, we helped. And people that were really going through a rough time, we washed, we, we basically cleaned their entire kitchen, and we gave cards, right? We impacted, because we're united. Because we're united. And so as I was thinking about, uh, for our summer theme, where I wanted to like base our scripture, um, base our thoughts around this idea of unity, I, uh, you know, and it's all over the place, I eventually settled on what we just read, Ephesians chapter 4, verses 1 through 6. And can I tell you that with, within that scripture, there is so much to be learned about with unity. And what I've done for us today, uh, it's not going to take too long. There's, there's three different sections of going through Ephesians 4, verses 1 through 6. And I hope that as we go through this, you might see the importance of unity and why it's important to God, why it should be important to you. The first thing is this. When you read Ephesians 4, verses 1 through 6, the first verse, it reads, Paul writes, I therefore, a prisoner for the Lord, urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you've been called. What does unity require? What does unity require for us to be people that love each other and be united together? Well, it's going to require us to walk worthy of our calling. When I was thinking about all of these ways that we could represent that in class, I, I settled on 1 Peter 2. And Peter writes it beautifully in 1 Peter 2 uh, of you when you think about what does it mean that I'll walk worthy of my calling. In 1 Peter 2, he starts by saying this in verse 1. He says, So put away all malice and deceit, hypocrisy and envy and all slander. And like newborn infants, he says, Long, some translations say desire, for the pure spiritual milk that by it you may grow up into salvation. He says, if indeed you have tasted that the Lord is good. What does it mean that I walk worthy of my calling? Well, when I read that and what Peter says, I immediately think of Psalm 42. You know what's in there in the ver first verse? It says, just as the deer pants for the water, so my soul longs after you, Lord. There's a desire within me to be with God. And not only that, but it's because of what you find in Psalm 34, if you keep reading in what Peter writes. He says, this is because you have tasted and you have seen that the Lord, well, he's good. And he will not let you down and he loves you. You keep reading in 1 Peter 2 and you see that you're longing for this. And what that brings is this, is that you come to him as a living stone. Rejected by men, but in the sight of God. You're chosen, and you're precious. What Peter's going to do with this idea of a living stone, we're going to get to it, but it's really awesome imagery, and it's taken from your Old Testament. But what, it, what I see right there at the end of it, and it means a lot to me because Psalm 8 is like one of my favorite psalms ever. When you read Psalm 8, what you're going to find is that David is writing and he sees the works of God all around him. He sees the great mountains and the valleys, right? The nature, and he sees how beautiful it is. And what he does in Psalm 8 around verse 4 is he says, What is man that you're mindful of him? What's man that you're mindful of him, God? I see the works of your great creation and how powerful you are and what you can make, yet you love me. It's a question that he asks. And then David writes, he says, Yet you've, you've crowned him with glory and honor. You are chosen and precious in the sight of God. A living stone. He keeps writing. And he says, You yourselves like living stones. And then he uses this. He says, You're being built up as a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood to offer sacri spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. And so what you find here, and you think about our, our base of study in Ephesians 4, verse 1, is really this. It's the question of, who am I? What does it mean that I walk worthy of my calling? Well, who you are, from Peter's terms here in 1 Peter 2, is this. You're a living stone that's chosen by God and precious 
in his sight. And also with that, you're being built up as a living stone into this spiritual house. Right? That is, hear me now, this is important. That is built on the cornerstone that is Christ himself. What does it mean to walk worthy of my calling? Well, it means I keep everything right here in mind. And I walk in light because I've been brought from darkness. And I walk in love because God loved me. And I imitate Christ in everything that I do. I walk in a manner worthy of my calling. It's what it takes for unity. And so as we, as we think about this first section, this first idea, I want you to see for unity to be done here, it's going to require each and every one of us as individuals to walk worthy of that calling to which we've been called. More than that, and he keeps talking, he says, not only is it going to, is it going to require you to walk worthy of your calling, but you're going to have to have some Christ-like qualities, right? It's kind of like a duh moment, right? If I'm walking worthy of my calling and Christ is my cornerstone, shouldn't I probably look like Jesus himself? Maybe. When you read Ephesians 4, verses 2 through 3, it says, with all humility and gentleness, it says, with patience, bearing with one another in love, and you're eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. You start looking at, at, at what all these different terms mean. You look at humility. If you, if you turn to Philippians 2, uh, you're going to see that humility and unity kind of have an interesting tie together. Uh, Paul here at the beginning of Philippians 2 says this. It says, so if there is any encouragement in Christ, any comfort from love, any participation in the Spirit, any affection and sympathy, complete my joy by being of what? By being of the same mind and having the same love and being in full accord and of one mind. If you are a follower of Christ, if you have any participation in the Spirit of what you were given at baptism, right? If you have any of that, complete the joy by being united together, by being of one mind, having the same love. He keeps going and he says, you want this to, to happen. He says, well, one of the first things you're going to have to do is you're going to have to be a little bit humble. He keeps writing in verses 3 through 4. He says, do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit. He says, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. And let each of you look not only to his own interest, but also to the interest of others. And here's the really cool part that Paul does in Philippians 2. He says, be united. And he says, if you want to be united, it's going to take a little bit of humility on your part. And then he says, it's not just because humility sounds good and I want you to do that. He says, because Christ is humble. In Philippians chapter 2, verses 5 through 11, where it says that Christ humbled himself to the point of death. Where it says that Christ humbled himself to the point of not only death, but death on a cross, right? God himself humbled to the point where he dies for me and you. Unity. What does it take? It takes a little bit of humility. Not only that, but you keep reading in Ephesians 4, verses 2 through 3. You're going to see that humility has some other, or, uh, unity has some other qualities within it. You think of gentleness, and you turn to Galatians chapter 6, verse 1. This is right after the fruit of the Spirit, right? Where it says, if you walk by the Spirit, you will have these fruits. This is what your life will, will result in. And in Galatians chapter 6, verse 1, he says, if anybody has a transgression, they come up to you. He says, you are to restore them in a spirit of gentleness. And you ask the question, why? Well, Jesus himself was gentle. You think of Matthew chapter 9, verses 9 through 12, where Jesus calls a tax collector, Matthew. And not only that, but he goes and he eats with Matthew and his friends who are tax collectors. And people say, you're eating with tax collectors. And what does he say? He says, well, I'm here for people that need a physician. <laughs> I'm here to help people. Christ was gentle. More than that, right there, you look at patience and love. You want unity? It's going to require you to be patient and to you to, for you to bear with one another in love. And you think of a, a great chapter uh, in your Bible in 1 Corinthians chapter 13. You look in verse 4. The very first thing that Paul writes, he says, love is blank. And the first thing he writes is what? Love is patient. 
and it's kind. Why do, why do I bear with people in love? Well, because Christ did. You look in 1 John 4, verses 8 through 11, and that's a, that is a, a verse that we go to a lot about Christ's love. It's there that says God is love, right? And it says what, how. How is God love? And it says that he sent his son to be a propitiation for your sins. And then in verse 11, what does it say? It says, now you are to love one another. You look at the idea of patience, and you look in 2 Peter verses 3 through 8, where it says that God is, is patient with you, hoping that no one falls, but everyone is found to be repentant. 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 8. And with all these things in mind, what happens is that now you're eager to maintain unity in the bond of peace, Right? Ephesians chapter 4. And so what are we looking at? And we're getting to our last section, so bear with me. What we're looking at is this. If we want to be united, we're going to have to walk worthy of our calling. Not only that, but if we're going to be united, we're going to have to walk worthy of our calling and also have Christ-like qualities. And then the last thing, this, this last little section that we're going to get into, is that if we want to be united, we're going to have to remember all that we have in common. Ephesians chapter 4, verses 4 through 6, Paul, Paul writes this. He says, there is one body and one spirit. He says, just as you were called to the one hope that belongs to your call, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, and also he's over all and he's through all and he's in all. Oneness. Did you catch it when we first started? In Acts 1, verse 14, what does it say? They were of one mind, full accord. Also, you go over to Philippians chapter 2. Did you catch it? They were of the same love, same mind, one mind, full accord. It's all wrapped up in your scripture of this idea of oneness because we're all in, made in common by it. You think about 1 Corinthians chapter 12, and we talked about it a little bit here when we did the communion, but you think about 1 Corinthians 12 where it says you are one body, and in, and in verse 13 it says, for in one spirit we are all baptized into one body, and it says it's not just certain people, it says it's Jews or Greeks, it's slave or free, you think of Galatians chapter 3 verses 26 through, through 27, it says everybody has the chance to taste and see. Everybody has the chance to be a part of this body. And then at the very end of 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 27, it says, Now you are the body of Christ, and individually members of it. And the really cool thing is that you can combine this verse with Ephesians chapter 1, verses 20 through, 22 through 23, where it says that Christ is the head, catch it, of the body. He is what we strive to be. So not only are you one body, not only do you have that in common, but you're also one spirit. And you think about what, it, what does that mean? Well, you go to 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 10 through 11, and Paul writes this. He says, these things God has revealed to us through the spirit. He says, for the spirit searches everything, even the depths of God. And please see what is highlighted right there, because it, it really helped me. It says, for who knows a person's thoughts except the spirit of that person which is in him. And then Paul makes it make sense right here. He says, so also no, no one comprehends the thoughts of God except the Spirit of God. It doesn't just end there, though. Because if you read 1 Corinthians chapter 2 and you read one more verse, you're going to see that Paul writes this right after that. He says, now we have received not the Spirit of the world, but the Spirit who is from who? God. You have the Spirit that is from God. You ask, how does that happen? I'll refer you back to Acts chapter 2, verse 38. What are we to do? And Peter says, repent and be baptized and receive the Holy Spirit. You get it. And we're kind of skipping ahead, but you talk about how we're united through one baptism. You look at Romans 6, verses 3 through 4. You're buried with Christ, and you're raised to walk in newness of life. 
You look in 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 21, where Peter reflects on Noah and the ark, and he says, this corresponds to it. He says, baptism now saves you. You look in the entire book of Acts, not only Acts 2, but Acts 8, where it says that Philip and the eunuch, and the eunuch says, here's water, what's hindering me from being baptized? Acts 9, where Saul converts into Paul, and he's baptized, right? Acts 10, you have Peter and Cornelius, right? You have Acts 16 with Lydia. All throughout Acts, what do they all have in common? Baptism. So you are united through one body, which also is united through one spirit that you have through God, through one baptism that we all have in common. And you keep going. It says that we are all united through one hope. And you reflect on Hebrews chapter 6. And can I tell you that this is one of my favorite passages in the Bible. Because in Hebrews chapter 6, verses 13 through 19, the Hebrew writer says that God made, a prom- he made two things. He made a promise and an oath that you are not going to be let down. And at the end, in verse 19, this is what he says. He says, we have this as a sure and steadfast anchor of the soul. What is hope? Well, it enters into the inner place. And it goes behind the curtain, and you reflect about the Old Testament, and how they had the Holy of Holies, and you, you think of how Jesus, he was on the cross, and what happens to that, to that veil? It's torn into two. The hope of Christ within you, through one body, one spirit, one baptism, and a hope that anchors you in where you're not going to be let down. You keep reading, and it says that you are united through one faith. And you look at Hebrews chapter 11. You look in verses 1, verse 3, and verse 6. It's right here. It says, verse 1, Now faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. Then you skip to verse 3. It says, by faith we understand the universe was created by the word of God. What is faith? It's believing that God said, if God says, I am this, then I believe that. I'm the creator of the universe, God. By faith, I believe that. I died for you, and now you have hope. By faith, I believe that. You're united through one faith. And then you get to Hebrews chapter 11, uh, verse 6, and it says right, right here, it says, without faith, this is kind of like a duh moment. Without faith, it's impossible to please him. Duh. Why? Because whoever would draw near to God, well, you got to believe he exists, right? You are united through faith. Baptism, hope, spirit, body. And then you get to one of the last ones, and you're united through one Lord, one Father, who is over all, through all, and in all. And you look in John chapter 14, verses 9 through 10, and this is one of the cooler moments in Jesus' ministry. He's talking about uh, that he is the Father, right? And the Father is within him. And Philip says in verse 8, he says, Jesus, show us the Father, and it's enough for us. And in John chapter 14, verses 9 through 10, Jesus responds by saying this. He says, have I been with you so long and you still do not know me, Philip. He says, whoever has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show me the Father? Do you not believe that I am the Father and the Father is in me? You have one Lord, one Father over all, who cares for you immensely, who listens to your prayers when you're hurting, who has said, I have died for you, and you now have hope of eternal life. I mean, my goodness. All these things that you're united in, and this right here is the one thing that I think comes to mind after reading the entire thing. Unity is the natural outcome of a heart set on Christ. Unity is the natural outcome of a heart set on Christ. Why? Because if I'm going to have unity, well, what that means is that I'm walking worthy of my calling. If I'm going to have unity, well, that means that I am imitating Christ to the best of my ability, and I'm, I'm humble, and I'm, I'm gentle with people, and I'm patient, and I love people. Unity requires me to remember everything that I have in common with every single one of you that is a fellow believer. And that is that we are united through body, 
Spirit, hope, faith, baptism, Lord, Father, above all, who's in us and through us and over us. Unity is the natural outcome of a heart set on Christ. Please remember all of this. Everything that we've talked about. I want to end with one of the cooler things that I think you see in Jesus' life in your Bible. When you turn over to John chapter 17, you're going to see that Jesus is, is praying to God. And one of the cool things about John 17 is that in this prayer, Jesus is mainly talking about unity. He says, Lord, I pray that they are one, just as what? As me and you are one. John chapter 17, around verse 20. I hope this makes it real for you because it's such a cool place that you get to see you in Scripture. John chapter 17, verse 20. He says, I do not ask for these only. He says, but also for those, catch it, who will believe in me through their word. Who's that? Me and you. <laughs> me and you. That's who that is. He says in verse 21, that they may all be one, and we said it, just as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they also may be in us, so that the world may believe that you have sent me. Unity is so important. So important. I pray that today you are united with everyone in here. And you remember how you were to walk with Christ. You remember everything that you have in common. Because God loves unity. We gather here in Jesus' name.